All right, so we're back. The Rue Strong Podcast, episode number 012. Getting up there again, keep it moving, keeping it going forward in progression. Today, I had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Shea Pierre. He's a strength and conditioning coach out of Canada. He works a lot with youth athletes all the way up into the professional setting. Works a lot of speed, agility, and power work. The guy does phenomenal things. I've seen him on Instagram. I like what he does. And we talk about everything that has to do with speed, power, and agility, and change of direction, and how he goes about coordinating that into his training programs for all of his athletes, from the youth all the way up into the pro levels. We also talk about branding and how to build a business. He does a great job by producing a lot of content, helping people understand what they need to do to get better and then also again from just a constant a reminder of what he is and what he does on a constant basis very important this guy again like i said he's out there he's doing it the right ways i highly recommend you check him out and first i want to go ahead and thank the sponsors revive md go ahead and check out revivesubs.com you can get my own very own phil deru athlete stack where it will have in there vitamin d D3, K2, turmeric, multivitamin, a multimineral, also omega-3s, and adrenal support too as well to help you with recovery and overall performance. You can check it out there at revivesubs.com. Make sure you check out with the discount code DeRoostrong20 to get 20% off your final sale. Also want to make sure you guys check out my brand new YouTube channel that we have here that you can guys can actually see the video itself, the Roo Strong Podcast YouTube channel. Go on there and subscribe so that you can win a chance to get a free program from me, six-week MMA off-camp program, totally for free. All you have to do is subscribe to the YouTube channel. Now that we got that out the way, let's get on to the interview with Shea Pierre. Mind somewhere else and keep going. That little voice in your head is trying to stop you from getting to where you want to be. Be successful and keep moving forward. With your host and world renowned strength and conditioning coach, Phil Delroux. I have with me one of the one of the guys that I look at for speed and power and agility. I seen him on social media. We talked a lot on DMs. Shea Pierre, Shea. How you doing, brother? I'm doing well, man. It's been a long time coming. We've been kind of interacting with each other for the last couple of years. So, uh, you know, I appreciate it, man. And uh, it's, it's good to be on here. Yeah, man. You sent me over those Pierre bands. And I'm going to tell you, my athletes loved them and hated them at the same time. And I think it was something that we utilized very well, especially with the fighters getting closer to the fights and making sure they're peaking right on time. So thank you for that, too. The, that gift was uh, tremendous for us. So, so. It, for the people that are listening and watching right now that don't know who you are, right? Once you give them a little bit of background, give them an intro, let them know who you are, how you got started, and how you, you know, developed this brand that you have now. Yeah. So, man, it's, I, I don't want to take up too much time. It could, it could be a long-winded answer for this one, but um, you know, I've loved training and everything about training since I was, you know, in high school. And I always tell the story of, you know, I used to like I'm a trainer now, but you know, I used to train in high school. Um, because um, uh, one Christmas, I actually uh, bought a DVD, and, and back then, you know, uh, YouTube was just in its infancy, so I used to watch as much um, uh, YouTube videos as I could on speed and agility and quickness and, you know, acceleration and deceleration, all that stuff, and it was just on NFL players, because my, my, my background is in uh, football, you know, that's what I was brought up to do, and, and so when I was in high school, I bought uh, a speed DVD from Preci Speed School. You know Preci Speed School down there? Oh yeah, definitely, but, definitely. So I bought that, and uh, so then when it came in during Christmas, I literally watched the entire DVD like 20 times. Call up all my friends, and I said, "Hey man, we got to do this immediately when we get back to school because nobody was training." And uh, so we got back there. We're doing all the ladder drills, all the mm -hmm. plyometric drills, running stairs, push-ups, lunges, squats, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff because we didn't have access to weights at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Lord behold, within about two years, we, you know, we were one of the top high school uh, programs in Canada. Yeah. Um, um, uh, four of us um, and within that um, age group ended up going to the CFL uh, mm -hmm. many years later, about six years later. So you could tell that the training uh, had had a big impact on it. So then I went to university. I studied uh, psych and sports. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also played four years of uh, football there. 
I was lucky enough to get drafted to the CFL uh, in 2012. Um, and then I guess at that point, my, my goal in university, because um, I spent a lot of time with all the teams working on their training systems and all the stuff, doing all their assessments. And so my goal was always to put together like, um, you know, my own brand one day. And so, so I started in my last year of university, starting to really train the football teams. I didn't like the way that they were training. Yeah. You know, we, we were training almost like bodybuilders and nothing against mm-hmm. bodybuilders, but that had no correlation to our on-field performance, right? Mm-hmm. So we're getting bigger, uh, slower and stiffer, right? Mm-hmm. Cause all we we're doing was Olympic lifting and we're, all we're doing was, uh, you know, heavy squats, heavy bench press, every, everything was, and then all this machinery. And I felt like I was getting real big and, but I wasn't getting any faster. Mm-hmm. And so, I said, I'm just going to do it my way. So I kind of left the team way and I said, I'm just going to do it this way. How do you get better for football? Well, you do more football specific movements. You want to mm-hmm. be quick, fast, agile, you know, dynamic. That's the kind of stuff you want to do. That's one of the stuff you kind of want to mimic. Mm-hmm. And so I started to develop my own system, you know, um, off of all these different methodologies and philosophies that I was learning. And then I started to do a lot of traveling to people that I respected and want to know more about what they were doing. Gotcha. And so in this process, I was also playing in the CFL. And so I was learning a lot from the physiotherapists, a lot of the players and so much other, you know, kind of tools at my disposal. And so I played three years there and during my last year. And as you know, you know, football is very political. So Mm -hmm. I'm thinking I'm about to get an opportunity about to start. And when I got drafted my first year, I tell you, it's long winded. But when I got (laughs) drafted my first year, um, you know, I, I came out and, um, in, 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 in Canada, if you're, if you're not an American, uh, uh, um, it all depends on the position. So I play cornerback. Mm-hmm. And so they, they take more Americans and put them at defensive backs. And so they're going to put me as a free safety. So mm-hmm. I was playing free safety. And so I never have an opportunity to play a position I'm playing. So I actually get sent back to school. So I played another year of high school, uh, I mean, uh, college ball. Then I went back and I got picked up by another team. I played two years there. But the coach that didn't want me at my first team ended up being the head coach of the team I was on for two years. Mm-hmm. So he comes over, he cuts me because he, he was, I wasn't the guy. So at this point I said, I'm not going to play anymore. I'm probably, I'm just going to put all my eggs into my basket that I want to develop my own brand. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I started literally, and this is where the story gets a little bit more, you know, humble. And I think a lot of people have stories like this. It's like, I had next to nothing. All my savings, I had about $15,000 saved up from playing the CFL from a few years. Mm-hmm. And so, I put all my money into building a basement gym. Mm-hmm. And at the time, um, I didn't think anybody was ever gonna come. I didn't have the confidence that I have today because you know, who, who's gonna show up to a basement gym? Like who, what, mm-hmm. what, what athlete wants to come to your basement? It, it was like three, 400 square feet. You know, I didn't have the nicest equipment, but I tried to put as much money as I could into it. And I tried to make it look really legit. Yeah. And, and so I went back to the old high school that I had uh, you know, first told the story of when I started to go there and work with my friends. And so I mm-hmm. went back to my old high school and I started to uh, help out with the high school team. And, uh, and then at the end of the season, one kid, one kid came and trained with me. And mm-hmm. anyway, that one kid actually just got drafted today. I mean, a couple of weeks ago to the CFL. Nice. So he was training with me since he was in grade 10 and he just got drafted to the CFL. Because he was a, such an amazing athlete, he did so great, more kids start to trickle in the basement. Yeah. One and another, one become another. And next thing I know, I started to have teams down there. Mm-hmm. And I, I had like literally 10 kids in a 300 square foot basement, like just like bunched up, you know, doing these exercises. And it was, and then now we got a, a 12,000 square foot facility. Yeah. You know, so it was, it, it was a long road, but hopefully I was long winded, but it could have been a little 12, bit easier. So 12,000 square feet. So that, so that time frame, hold on, you can't just skip that, man. What, what happened in between there? You went from three, 400 square feet to now 12,000. So there had to be so something going on. There's, there's so many connections along the way. So I did, you know, so much, you know, work all around the province. I, I travel so many places. And so I met this um, one gentleman, his name's Richard Clark. Mm-hmm. And I actually seen him on YouTube training uh, John Tavares. You know who John Tavares is? He's, he's yeah. a hockey player, PK uh-huh. Subban. Okay. Um, so, so he was training all these elite level hockey players because where we come from in uh, Canada, hockey is the main sport. Football is not the main sport. So hockey is the main sport. So, and I was trying, and I was working with a lot of hockey guys at that time. And I, um, Lord behold, he actually was only about five minute drive from my house. I didn't even know that his facility existed. Mm. And so I message him, or I go put a DM, uh, or, or sort of, I'm not DM. I actually uh, go and put a nice uh, kind of like saying on one of his uh, Instagram posts. And he actually messaged me back the next day saying, oh, thank you so much. You know, I see that you're in the neighborhood. You want to come by my facility. 
So, so he has a, the 12,000 square foot facility. Mm-hmm. And so I go over there and me and him are chatting it up and he really likes my enthusiasm, my passion, my energy. And he offers me if I want to come and start training my athletes there. And at this point, I didn't know that it's not that his business was failing is that he only had a, a business that worked in the summertime for, for off season hockey um, uh, athletes. He, and then in the off season or in season, you just have, uh, you know, some boot camps, stuff like that, but he's trying to hold this facility on his own. Mm-hmm. And so I brought all my athletes there and I started to grow my brand. So I, I, I'll go from my 50 athletes to now we have almost 600 athletes there in, in, wow. in any given week. So we have so many athletes and teams going in through there that I end up just help, uh, buying it and me and him now are our, our owners. And he's I'm kind of on his way up because he's 66 years old now. So uh-huh. I met him when I was, when I was uh, he was 64. Gotcha. So it's like it was, so kind of like a transition, but so I didn't have to go through those lumps of it, go from three thousand, two thousand, five thousand, yeah. twelve thousand. I kind of just worked my way into a, um, a situation that maybe yeah. not a lot of people can come up with. Yeah, that's. I mean, you 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 took advantage of that situation, and now you're doing really well. So that that that's a testament to your abilities. You know, I always say it's like it's it's what you know that gets you in the door, or actually I should say it's who you know that gets you in the door, and then it's what you know that keeps you in the door. So for that. That's, again, that's a testament to you. As you're building your brand, I see it every day. Um, there's a ton of athletes that come in and out of there. You're talking youth athletes from what age? From like seven on, right? Like we, Yeah, we get kids like they're grade three all the way to professional. Yeah. Damn. So, so how do you go about scheduling that out? I know that, I mean, obviously you have a program, you have a system in place. What's the difference between you working with the youth athlete as opposed to the college athlete or high school athlete? And there is, is there any difference there too as well? So we work on a lot of like movement qualities, movement efficiency, movement mm-hmm. patterns, and really try to work on it from everybody's perspective. Because you can be a professional athlete and have a lot of you know, poor movements and you just got through it because you're a real special you know, specimen of an athlete. So when you come in here, we, uh, we work from you know, really analyzing and doing full assessments with all of, all, of our, all of our athletes and looking at everything. So, you know, and, I, and, and you're probably doing it too with your youth athletes all the way to your professionals. Like we'll look at, like, just look at like a simple, like squat. Mm-hmm. Very, very simple. It's going to tell you a lot of things. Is the foot going into, um, you know, pronation? Is the knee going into uh, valgus? Is the hips going to unleveling? That's going to tell us a lot of things, especially because with our athletes, we try to work on a lot of speed and agility. So if my athletes are constantly pushing off the inside edge of their foot, um, no matter what age, that's going to develop a, a poor motor pattern, and you're going to have a lot of issues going down the line, especially when they get older. And eventually, we, we can have Achilles shreds, knee tears, you know, mm-hmm. hip hip itises, so many different things that are going to be caused through this, mm-hmm. just through you know one simple mechanism problem, the mm-hmm. foot pronating, you know, that subtalar joint going to the hyperpronation. And so we, we look at simple things like that through assessments mm-hmm. and literally every athlete gets that screening. And then we start to look at 10 yard sprints, five, 10, five change, um, change of directions through video analysis and mm-hmm. seeing where are they pushing off of If It is inside edge. We got to fix it very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, we want everything outside edge, uh, make sure everybody's in uh, proper movement patterns. So then we can be more effective. We can be a, a lot more explosive as an athlete, but I have a lot of professional athletes because I'm also the head strength and conditioning coach of a CFL team now, so forgot to put that in there. But um, so we look a lot with our pro athletes and a lot of them just through their training in general and all their movements that they're going through, mm-hmm. through their strength training, they're developing these poor movement qualities and, and, and we're seeing a lot of injuries and we've started to really correct them just through these assessments. Mm-hmm. No, that's, that's, that's great because that was another thing I wanted to ask you was like, what was the assessment protocol for, for the youth athletes all the way up? Now, I know, I mean, do you do something basic like an FMS? I know you do the, the single leg squat and you're actually looking at motor patterns through agility type movements, change of direction. Um, is there anything from like a strength perspective, whether it be, you know, your go to KPIs for, for strength and understanding how an athlete can actually move underneath load? Yeah. So you want to be able to generate force and velocity and stuff like that. You know, we can do. Um, what we do sometimes is the more trap bar deadlifts. We like that because it's a little bit more anatomically correct because we can go into a squat and, you know, it's not always going to be translatable, but we're, um, as in we find more of the trap bar deadlift translatable and it's easier to teach. And we find that um, it, you get into a better movement pattern through that. But mm-hmm. what I like to do more is I like to work with my youngest athletes, even my professionals on how to develop a proper body weight movement base first. Okay. So we're looking at 
can my athlete do a proper lunge? A lot of athletes can't do a proper lunge, mm -hmm. front lunge, reverse lunge. And mm -hmm. what is that going to correlate to? If you can't do a proper single leg lunge, then you're not going to be able to decelerate properly, right? If you can't decelerate properly, you can't come to balance. You can't be uh, come under uh, uh, um, under control. And so you're going, to, you're going to get hurt eventually, right? So if you can't do that as a young athlete, then, then imagine me looking at it from a professional athlete, college athlete that's been doing these bad lunges, you know, side lunge, front lunge, uh, bad squats, then I'm not going to go load them um, either. Yeah, yeah. Of course, like you want to actually make sure that they have the proper joint prerequisites. They have the ability to move with just their body weight before you put load on them. That makes total sense. Now, if, if for the young guys, are you doing like more of that just body weight training only? Let's say, for instance, you're, I would say your middle school to, to just getting into high school. Are you starting to load them now, now that they have the efficiency of movement? Yes. Yeah, so what we like to do is, you know, and, and, and you're uh, familiar with triphasic training. Mm hmm. So we'll use that concept where we start to work on isometrics so we can work mm -hmm. on certain joint angles. We're starting to work on eccentric base movements so we can work on uh, absorbing force mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously concentric so we can explode out of it. But that has all relevance to sports. So once we've developed proper movement patterns, we've got proper base, now we can start to load um, the tissue, right? Mm -hmm. Load the musculature. And, but it has to be done properly. So, we'll, so we won't just throw them into a trap bar deadlift. We might do more... Um, you know, landmine squats, a little bit yeah. easier. It keeps you more upright. You can lean into it properly. You know, we yeah. might put them on slant boards, keep the inside ankle bone high, uh, m make sure because when you start to do squats stuff like that, we also have, you know, poor movement patterns in our day, right? So a lot of these kids have really tight ankles, yeah. uh, you know, more in the calf region. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, you know, they're always, you know, hunched over on their phone at their desk. So, so, so the long and tight in the back. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of these kids come in and we only see them once a week. So they get, so, so the, for, for them to move properly and have great mobility to go into deep range of squats uh, and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff is tougher. So we get them into a landmine and we lean them over. It actually puts you in a way better position because you keep a nice upright torso mm -hmm. and then you can lean into it, especially if we elevate the heels a little bit. So now mm -hmm. we, now, now we're getting rid of any uh, ankle problems and hip issues. And now we're allowing it to get more range of motion in these exercises so mm -hmm. land my squat unbelievable plus you're moving forward we're looking for forward locomotive right mm -hmm. so you everything wants to go straight ahead mm -hmm. so it's a much better exercise to do than to just put them into a back squat or mm -hmm. uh or um a trap bar deadlift so that you know it's a little bit easier yeah yeah so like with your isometrics and i know you do triphasic but are you doing a, a mixture of both like concentric or knee centric isometrics yes from there yes. okay well, so we might do five seconds lowering and then just to learn that position, we might hold that for another five seconds. Mm. And I always find it as, as a coach, it's easier to cue athletes, especially when you have numerous athletes, um, you know, you, you know, like teams, like 15 um, pl uh, players mm -hmm. that when you do something very slow, I can literally pick apart yeah. problems. Right. So if a kid's going down, all of a sudden he starts to round his back. I can say, Hey, chest up a little bit more. Mm. Right. So mm. then he, as he's going down, he's got mm. time to reset himself. Or the knee starts to go in. Okay, hey, push those knees out a little bit. Okay, make mm -hmm. sure that your feet are grounded. You can figure, you can fix those problems when you're doing slow eccentrics and isometric holes than you could if you're just going up and down quickly. You, you're yeah. not going to get much out of it. Yeah, and, and that's a good way to get them ready for those faster eccentrics. Is obviously you learn it slow and then you can speed it up over time. Um, and that's going to help with the stretch reflex and everything there. And I know you know a lot about that. And that's why I wanted to talk to you because I know primarily what I see is you are one of the experts in speed and agility. So when you're talking about effectiveness, what, what are like some of your most effective ways to develop speed um, for an athlete? Yes. Yeah, so, so we have two things, right? So we have change of direction and we have uh, actual agility work. Now, change of direction is like a pre-planned uh, um, work. So mm -hmm. I already know what I'm going to do. And so we use change of direction always with athletes first, because we want to make sure that they understand how to in and out of the brakes effectively. Right. Mm -hmm. So chest slightly over the knees and toes and be able to push off the outside foot, load into that hip, load the Achilles, load the IT bands and make mm -hmm. sure they're, they're, they're effectively pushing off right in a good position. Right. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the times that when we have athletes come in, they will do shuffling patterns. And when they go to shuffle, 
right? Their knees will go into valgus and they'll load the wrong way because they're always taught to touch with their outside hand. So what happens if I touch with my outside hand that I'm not actually loading up the tissue? But if I touch with my inside hand and lean back towards where I want to go, I'm pushing off the in, I'm pushing off the inside leg and the outside foot. So mm-hmm. that's going to effectively get me in and out of my break a little bit quicker. Mm-hmm. Whereas uh, uh, once they learn how to effectively get in and out of change of directions, and also one of the things that most athletes don't really look at, especially at change of direction, is where their eyes are going. So they're always fixated on how fast they're moving, but not how fast they're decelerating, uh, mm-hmm. and then where their eyes are going to get to the next cone. Mm-hmm. So uh, one of our mottos. Um, is it's not how fast you can run, it's how great you can slow down, it's not how high you can jump, it's how great you can land, so absorbing the force. So once you've yep. learned change of direction and the proper mechanics to get in and out of our brakes effectively, then we go to agility. Now agility is more, now you're self-scanning, visual components, decision-making to a, to a uh, stimulus. Mm-hmm. So basically your opponent, you know, you can use verbal cues, um, you can use, um, you know, um, different types of cues that are, aren't just uh, visual, but what we like to do is, you know, we use cones, throw it at guys, do be yep. more use of, we use a fit light training system, you know, the fit light system. Yep, so yep. now they have to cognitively be aware of, you know, where they're going and have that stimulus to react to something. That's mm-hmm. huge. And our athletes love it, absolutely love it mm-hmm. because it's, it makes it more enjoyable to do mm-hmm. speed exercises. Um, and then we do mirror drills, just basically, you know, if you can visualize it, you know, we got five yards uh, and then you just move shuffling side to side, trying to stay in front of somebody, almost like mm-hmm. a cat and mouse. Yep. Uh, we do it where, you know, we have uh, athletes running at each other and somebody has to try to get away, dodge and get around them. The other person's got to try to touch them. Maybe nice. you, uh, maybe we put on uh, like a little um, like sleeve inside like their, uh, their pants and all you do is try to pull that off. Mm-hmm. Right. So th- there's so many different ways for agility but they're totally two different things. And I think change of direction needs to be looked at first because you need to learn how to actually move before you can get into that stuff. But agility is the most effective because that's the most real time situation in games that you would actually do. Yeah, so you would say that's kind of like your general or directed uh, approach or, or I would say preparation towards getting you into true agility where getting closer to competition or an in season, right? Yeah, so like, We'll do a, so. So most of our athletes, we do about an hour and a half, and we predicate more, even at a pro level, more towards speed, agility, plyometrics than we do to actually strength. Now, strength is a huge component of it, mm-hmm. but the thing is, my my athletes, what do they do for a living? They move, they run, and what a lot of what I dealt with in the past is that we spend more time strength training, mm-hmm. and then we would go on the field, and it wouldn't it wouldn't correlate. Mm-hmm. Right now, now, now we're strong, but we haven't moved in the same way. So how do you get, it's like, how do you get ready for um, MMA? How do you get ready for combat sports? Well, you actually have to get in the ring and do five rounds. Yeah. You, know, mm-hmm. you can't go in the air dine. You can't go on the rowing machine. <laughs> you can't go for jogs and, and, and get the same stimulus, yeah. right? It's not the same energy system. So we try to mimic as much as we can, keep them in peak condition, keep them in peak form, move the same way you would after we've learned the biomechanics to actually put program that into them so we try to do as much mimicry into the agility work and the change of direction work as we can and we'll mm-hmm. just do the strength work as you know 30 minutes get in you know build mm-hmm. that base make sure it's strong so that can help reduce the in- uh, injuries but the injury is going to be more re- uh, reduced when they've learned how to pr- properly apply the speed and agility components because mm-hmm. a lot of these kids they sit all day they wear bad shoes Right. Mm-hmm. They're doing a, They're trying to mimic the best players in the world. And those best players in the world are doing a lot of shitty stuff. Uh, you might watch Odell Beckham. He comes off the line and he's doing all this inside edge stuff to try to fake out defenders. Well, he's just putting all that force in there. Right. A lot of these. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, George St. Pierre, 2011. Uh, I think it was when I read his book. Um, he's doing a lot of Olympic weightlifting. He's yeah. trying to do a lot of gymnastics stuff. This guy's doing a lot of backwards movement. He's doing backflips. He's landing mm-hmm. inside edge, inside edge, inside edge. What yeah. happens? 2011, he tears his ACL. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I seen that. I seen it coming. I was like, oh man, this is an accident waiting to happen, man. <laughs> but, but, makes but, but yet he thought all that great training, strength training, all that stuff was making him stronger. Is that, yeah. He was actually putting more strength on dysfunction. Yeah. It actually made him worse. 100%. Right? Mm-hmm. So, then, then, and I think he tore his ACL again, right? Mm. Because then he, he went back, he tried to get stronger doing all the, you know, all this Olympic lifting and powerlifting stuff, yeah. right? Look at John Jones. He had a year where he only did powerlifting. And yeah. I think when he came and fought, 
he was the worst version of ever that everybody's ever seen of him, right? So it's about yeah. trying to mimic the two. And I see you doing a lot of, you know, change of direction, your ladder mm -hmm. work, agility work, you know, fit mm -hmm. like all that kind of stuff. And that's going to have more play into their actual abilities because mm -hmm. you're reacting the same way you would in the sport. You're getting better at it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So... So let's let's break that down because I, I want the, the the listeners to understand like okay when you take an athlete let's say for instance you have a high school freshman coming in let's say they play football right what is the what is the first thing that you're gonna do with that particular athlete that ninth grader that's just getting into you know their 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 season in football or maybe off season whatever the case and you're actually trying to build them up in that quadrennial form. Yeah, so I'm going to probably go back to it again. We're going to go through all of our basic movement patterns. We won't touch a weight. Don't, we won't touch a dumbbell, kettlebell, anything until we master the proper movements. Mm -hmm. Once that is done, then we'll start to go through, you know, um, a movement phase or a strength phase mm -hmm. where we're just working on the basics. So, like, again, we're going to maybe work, maybe work on um, strength in the lower body and do a lot of single leg movements. Right. Okay. So we're going to do a lot of um, unilateral work. So yeah. I might just make sure because especially at that age, um, a lot of them are going to be unstable or unstable. They don't got a lot of balance. They don't got a lot of proprioception. They don't got a lot of awareness. Um, they don't have, you know, the ability to produce any force. So we're going to strengthen up a little bit. But we're, we're going to do it unilaterally because the, because the problem is a lot of these kids are more dominant on one side than the other. So mm -hmm. we might do some Bulgarian split squats before we even get to that. We might be just do regular split squats. Mm -hmm. right? So we might do some slow essential split squats, learn how to do absorb the force, slowly start to you know, progress our way to heavier weights, then maybe mm -hmm. go to uh, um, Bulgarian, do some step ups, do some lunges, you know, stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I'll, I'll do that even before I even do a squat. Squat yeah. is great, but I just want to make sure that they're, you know, they're balanced first. Yeah, you know, and I, and I took that actually from Joe DeFranco, and Joe talked about it a lot where he will do unilateral work in the off season, as opposed to a lot of coaches actually flip that around and they'll actually do more unilateral work in seasons because of the load isn't so high and then the neural fatigue won't be as established. So what he's basically trying to set and what I do now with the fighters and also with my high school guys is I'm trying to get them efficient on both sides of the body, right? So we can balance out the body, make sure that they're strong as a whole, and that globally we can put it together when we need to with max force and high velocities. So you're on the right track with that. I just wanted to make sure people knew you know, how to do it because there is a lot of things that I see that are wrong in the industry. Not going to call anybody out, but I want to make sure that we're we're relaying over the proper information for people. Yeah, like, um, like in season for my football guys, especially my mm -hmm. pro guys, we won't do a lot of unilateral exercises. Now, now we'll do them, but we won't load them up very heavy because yeah. they're practicing every day. So they'll practice. So, so my pro guys will practice three days a week, and then they'll take a day off, and they'll have their game. Uh -huh. So if you're doing unilateral work, right, you're breaking down like the muscles more than if you did it on. Uh, you know bilateral work but you have to go real heavy but we'll we'll do more joint specific angles so we won't do a full depth squat we might do a partial in the rack right mm -hmm. so it's not as much you know load on you so all you gotta do is come up and then maybe come down and then let the rack absorb everything for you mm -hmm. and that's, that's a little bit easier on your body than mm -hmm. if i was doing any type of eccentric work or isometric work in season because it's going to be too detrimental on you because you're going to go to practice and there's so much stimulus of running breaking yeah. down that fatigue that's gonna that's gonna break down your central nervous system it's gonna break down the musculature and so you're going to be needing recovery so you don't need to do it all in the weight room yeah. so the off season is when we do more of the you know unilateral work in season more bilateral work yeah. um but we're still doing like a like we'll do a, a ton with my guys making sure that the hamstrings are strong make sure the ankles are strong so mm -hmm. we'll do a ton of hamstring work in season but we'll just make sure that is maybe you know uh, you know dosed out throughout the entire week. Like we might do it right after practice, two sets of Nordic curls of you know, uh, two sets of three, right? Making mm -hmm. sure that we get one you know knee dominant, one hip dominant exercise in uh, mm -hmm. hamstrings. But that's one thing in football players that the hamstrings are weak, hamstrings aren't there, right? Then we're going to be looking at maybe some ACL injuries because mm -hmm. you know it attaches back there. Also, the ankles are weak, calves are weak. Especially we need to build a nice lateral uh, calf, you know, that mm -hmm. medial calf. Like, like you gotta you gotta strengthen up those areas because those are the areas that they use a lot, right? Yeah, so you gotta make sure that they're durable. Yeah, that makes sense. I always say like with 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 my guys, it's like especially the young kids. You see that they're 
that their feet are so weak unless they have like a, a background in dance or gymnastics you know we got to start from the ground up in that way and for me we will start with no shoes on making sure they're working through the base support system and uh, i'm gaining that strength and stability of the foot because again that's your base of support right um now i want to switch gears a little bit because not only are you a, a phenomenal coach right people know who you are but you also are a business owner you built your brand up very tremendously i can say and in all of that right how have you been able to become that authority figure in the speed and performance game as opposed to you know a lot of guys that get in the industry and they kind of just fall off because they're not putting out the quality content you've been able to do that for a long time now so how did how'd you go about doing that and how how can you sustain that yeah, you know what? I kind of got lucky, I think, because I was starting to put out content back in like 2014, 2015, when Instagram was at its infancy. And mm -hmm. I could kind of see, because um, I do a lot of like studies and analytics of, you know, that's not just into sports or anything. I mm -hmm. actually take a lot of info from the users that, that follow us and stuff like that. And I, and I found that a lot of uh, the athletes, all they want to do is get quicker. They want to get faster. They want to get more explosive. So I said, mm -hmm. we're going to build our brand around that. Yeah. When you come to our gym, you know, we're going to you know, show you the basic movements, how to get stronger, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I said, we want to get them in the door. Now there's no secret that you go on my Instagram, you're going to see a lot of explosive dynamic, you know, show, you know, show stopping yeah. kind of stuff that's going to draw your attention. And mm -hmm. that's what we want. So we built a brand around, you know, being very explosive and people really like that because you know, not a lot of people can do those type of movements, yeah. right? It's like everybody is already can do a squat. Everybody can do, you know, or, or properly they bench press. They see all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. they'll, they'll surpass it on your page, right? But when they see myself or something, you know, jumping up, doing a split tuck jump, coming back down, do like it looks cool and it draws you in. And yeah. then once we have your attention, we can say, hey, you want to try to get to this point? Let me show you through my, you know, developed system over the years. I'm not going to do it right away, but here's a step-by-step -step approach where you can start to become more athletic, even though a lot of athleticism is more genetic. Like mm -hmm. you, you might not be able to jump as high as me or run as fast as me, but you can start to get some of the movement qualities that you see. Mm -hmm. And so we've built a brand around, you know, just being explosive athlete. Who doesn't want to be an explosive athlete, right? Nobody mm -hmm. wants to be a slow athlete, right? So <laughs> we, we tell that story. And we tell that story very well, I think, through our Instagram account because people want that. And so I, I kind of understand what people are looking for. And then it's all real. Like what you see from me is like I got the energy, the enthusiasm, the charisma. And mm -hmm. when you have some of that stuff, I'm not trying to be cocky or anything, when you have that, people gravitate towards, you know, certain energy. And, you know, I don't put people down. You know, I don't try to start fights with people. I'm all yeah. real. I try to help as many people as we can. Yeah. You know, we, we answer all our DMs, all of our Facebook messages. People, I got mm -hmm. people that call me. We do as much as we can to help people because yeah. all people want to do is get better. That's mm -hmm. all they want to do at the end of the day. And, you know, to tell you that what philosophy or methodology or system they're using, they just want to become a better athlete. So if I can show them, you know, this is an opportunity for you to get better uh, through this system, then, you know, hopefully they can come and walk through the doors and we can show them. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've, you've shown that too with the amount of, of information that you're putting out there on a constant basis. I've actually been watching you for a while now. And I'm not going to lie, I took some of your stuff too as well. Hopefully I gave you your credit for it because, it, it, you know, credit is due there. Um, now, what I do want to do is I want to take one question from a DM that I got based off of the, uh, the post I put up for you. Um, this question comes from Zach Spino. Spino's S-A, I don't know. Sorry, fellow. I, I don't know how to say your name. But anyways. So the uh, question is, do you, do you too believe, so he's asking me too as well, you can build an incredible SNC career without having a university degree? I'll let you take that one first. Yeah, you know I think you can because, you know, you have mentorship programs, mm -hmm. right? And say I wanted to come and I want to learn under the tutelage of you. Yep. And all I want to do is spend my time and learn exactly what you're doing. That might be, you know, just as effective in a sense of I want to go direct to the source. It's like a mechanic. There's a mechanic going to go to university or is he going to go and learn from another mechanic? Now, there are things that you're going to have to learn about the body and biomechanics and you know how the body functions. But mm -hmm. if you want to learn it a little bit quicker, maybe you're past the age, maybe you can't afford to go into university, you don't have the mm -hmm. money, right? You might go and, you know, do Phil DeRue's mentorship program. 
and learn under his tutelage of the fight game, how he works with athletes. You know, we're all learning from some mentor, mm-hmm. right? And so you, you, you can do travels. You know, you, you can learn in so many different ways because a lot of people, they might not have the money to go to university. It's just not in the cards for them. That doesn't mean that they can't learn. They can't yeah. go online. You know, they can't go you know, to, to different resources on uh, the computer to learn. They, uh, they can't get books and articles and videos. And yeah. there's ways that you can do it and still be a very effective coach. And I'll tell you this, I have a lot of friends with master's degrees mm-hmm. and those guys barely even have five clients. And it's not that they're not great coaches because yeah. a lot of great coaching comes from you as a person. You have to be able to effectively take those skills and everything that you've learned and then mm-hmm. display it back to an athlete. And if you don't have mm-hmm. that personality to do it, yeah. then how are you going to, like, there's gonna be a disconnect. So also you need to be able to learn to talk to people Right. Like, you know, I was fortunate enough that, you know, I, I ran my my uh, private business. I never once wanted to become a head strength coach of anything. It wasn't it wasn't something I was looking for. I love developing, you know, in the private sector. I love working with young athletes. I love developing that. And one day I get a, I, I get a call from a university. Hey, we're looking at some guys, you know, that you've trained before. These are our best players on our team. Um, I don't know what they're doing in the offseason, but they're not training with us. And our head strength coach is leaving, you know, the job opportunity. Do you want to come? And I said, ah, uh, you know, sure, I'll come. So I go there for a year and, you know, their, their, their physiotherapist was one of the best in the whole industry. Mm. And um, I actually got to learn more from him about certain, uh, you know, certain things. And then, you know, our, our, our team, we got no injuries that year. It was an unbelievable year. Nice. We go all the way to the championship. Unfortunately, we lost, but we had such a great turnout. Um, uh, in, in performance that all of a sudden I get a, a, a call from a professional team. They're like, Hey, we got some guys that you're training. These are one of the best players on my team, you know, <laughs> and, and actually the professional team that I actually uh, ended up going to, they actually drafted me as a, uh, when I came out and I was always in the training room talking with the trainers. Um, mm-hmm. I was always a good person around the staff, you know, the mm-hmm. GMs, all that kind of stuff. So they knew that, you know, here's a football guy. He's got a great background. He he understands, you know, football. He understands, you know, the people in the room. Yeah. Uh, and I was uh, 30 at the time, 31 now. I got the job last year. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he can understand and be personable to these people. So I come in. I do a little interview there. They're like, mm-hmm. all right, man, you want the job? Took the job. So I thought, well, why not become a professional coach in something? And, you know, it might be pretty cool. So I go there, and we had a bit of losing season, but mm-hmm. the first year that they never had an ACL tear. Yeah. Right. That's good. So, for, for, so you know, we, we, had, we had some pec tears and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. that, that was the first time I ever seen a pec tear. And, it's, and you, you know, football, you go for a tackle, you put your arm out, you miss, he's going right through your arm. You can't, you, you, yeah. you can't train. That's that. trauma. Like, it's, I, that's trauma. Then it's not, it's not really. Right. It's so, not so, 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 like we're, so we got yeah. had a couple injuries here and there, but I learned so much and, and, and it was a great experience. And, and so, but those are things that like most people just couldn't do because mm-hmm. it's more personality based at the same time as well. Like yeah. you can know everything, but if you don't have the personality to, to give it to somebody, then you, you're not gonna be an effective coach. Yeah, I think, I, and I get that a lot with the interns that come see me, you know, they, they have this large base of, of technical knowledge, book smarts. Um, they have a baseline of understanding of proper biomechanics, physiology, you know, physics, everything there. Um, but when it comes down to relaying over information like you talked about, communication is going to be very key for somebody who doesn't know or probably doesn't even want to know what you know. They just want to do what we need to do to get better. And so for that, you have to be able to reframe and relate it over to the athlete appropriately so that they can do what they need to do to get better. Um, and that was that's something that, you know, a lot of the new kids lack in this industry is that. They don't get a lot of experience. Maybe they don't do an internship or they don't get a mentor or something along the lines of that to where they're working on the floor for a good six months to a year and actually get to train so many types of individuals. When I first started, I used to work with everybody under the sun. I worked with uh, youth athletes all the way up to it. I had a 68 year old client who was an ex baseball player, you know, and and everything in between there. So I had to adapt certain types of communication for one and also the training means to help that individual and if you don't have that ability if you don't have that that experience and that practical application to do so it's gonna be very hard for you to be successful in this industry so that's my answer i i think 
I think Shay's answer was a little bit better. Maybe a little bit more. I also on think that our backgrounds, um, also in sport, play a huge part of it, right? You you uh, participate in MMA. You played college football. You have a great sports background, probably growing up. So you relate better to the athletes, whereas mm. in maybe somebody that's very book smart, they know exactly what they're doing. I don't know. I'm not saying that their training is not going to be as effective, but yeah. there's more of a buy-in from the beginning, right away, from an athlete that if you look the part. Yeah. You know, obviously, you know, you talk the part and all that mm. stuff and you can relay that message by just showing them because sure. I show everything. Right. So, you know, if, if I'm going to tell my athlete to do something, they're going to see me do it before yeah. they even do it. So they're like, oh, shit, this guy just jumped a 40 inch vert. Oh, uh-huh. this guy just got in and out of his break, you know, like this. Right. Whereas I've had interns come in and they will show an exercise and it looks dog awful. And yeah. right. Because yeah. they can't move better. But yes, they, te- they, they understand everything but they can't do it. So when they go to do it, the athlete's like, oh boy, that didn't look good at all. Like, that, yeah. you want this guy to be teaching me? Yeah. The buy-in, boom, gone, right away. And, and I've For seen sure. it many times, right? So now that you can effectively show it, teach it um, properly, the, the buy-in is right away, right away. Yeah, that, I, I think that's one of the missing links right there, you know, is having the ability to showcase it first and, and practice what you preach. You know, for me, obviously, I fought for eight years and I can show the guys and I can also, again, relay over certain movements and and techniques and directed exercises that will correlate over to the sport. And then I can actually reframe it to the point of where they understand why it's going to correlate over to the sport, whereas most people can't do that because of the fact that they don't have that knowledge of the sport. They just have the basics understandings of science. Don't get me wrong, like science you do need. Don't, that's, that's not what I'm saying. But at the end of the day, we need to have both. We need to be able to bridge that gap. You know? So that's, that's a good explanation. They trust, they trust it more. Yeah, exactly. All right. So I got, one, well, I got three of my common questions that I'm going to go ahead and ask <coughs> you. The first one is going to be, who are the most influential people of your life? All right. So far, it could be, you know, it could be anybody, really. But who were the most who was the people that influenced you the most? I always got to say my mom. So, you know, I grew up with a stepfather that loved me, you know, helped me out a lot. But more my mother, because, you know, mm. for as long as I could live, even today, she'll send me text messages mm. saying, you know, you can do it. You know, you can be anything you want to be. You know, just keep working hard. And I mm. literally got that on a daily like we had a, a huge calendar um, you know, when I was younger and this whole thing was, you know, you're going to run a four five, you know, you're going to get an, an A on the next test. You know, you're going to you, you know, be whatever you want to be like, we, like literally anything I ever want. She had a million dollar, um, you know, uh, uh, bill up on my wall. Like right when I went to go to turn on the light switch, it was right there. So I always visualized, you know, doing great things. Uh, it, it was the, like the mindset was always built there. Mm-hmm. One of the things I learned in school is, you know, it's physical, but it's mental and it's emotional. Right. So you got mm-hmm. those three things. And if you look at the spectrum, right, there's going to be a lot of other things in there like recovery and the diet and all that stuff. But, you know, mm-hmm. training is just one aspect of it. And so mm-hmm. if you have somebody in your life that's constantly telling you you can do something, you can achieve this, right? Or if you have somebody in your life that's constantly saying, yo, you can't do that. Oh, mm-hmm. it's not going to happen for you. It's not in the cards for you. You know, you're not yep. built for this. You're not fast enough. You know, you're slow. You're never going to catch the ball. Yeah. What do you think your subconscious is going to tell you when those things come up in your life? So, you know, my mother... Uh, I always say surround yourself with positivity, be around other people, you know, uh, you know, your, your net worth or is, is is your net work is your net worth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I surround yourself with those real good, strong, positive people. um, And that's the only way that you're going to survive because if you're always around troubled people, then that's the only place you're going to go. So I'll say my mom, she was the most influential person, especially seeing her work ethic and her drive and determination that allowed me to, you know, create a successful business and, and have that passion and that desire to continuously work hard. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I mean, there's always somebody in your life that that changes your perspective in a lot of ways. And for ha- to have that positive affirmation every day, every time you woke up, it, it's a testament to why you're so successful. So that's that's a great answer. Can I get your daily morning routine? I know a lot of a lot of successful people have these routines. They have rituals. What exactly do you do on a daily basis every morning? Everybody wants to know. Yeah, so you know what, like, and I'm not telling athletes that they should do this, but I barely sleep. Like, I got bags under my eyes. It's just, it's yeah. just who I am now. Like, I just work like a workhorse, and I don't even know how to separate 
you know, sometimes work from anything else. And it, it, it's kind of troublesome, you know, especially at home with a family, growing family. I work way too much. So we actually schedule a lot of things the night before. So I already know what I'm going to do the next day. I already have like a pre-planned, you know, checklist. But I usually wake up around 5 o'clock, 5.30. Um, that's because, you know, in the – well, in the end season, I'm going to football practice. So I need to be there for 6. So, I mean, it only takes about 30 minutes to get there. But um, now I'm waking up at 5 o'clock because my son wakes up at 8 o'clock. So it gives me a three-hour gap to, you know, go start some emails out. Because I like to read the emails in the morning from the day before or to get back to people about them, mm-hmm. some things I need to get done that day. Because when you got a business like yourself, it's not just people in your country. You know, you got people in Asia, Europe, you know, Australia, all over that the time difference. So we want to make sure we hit it right away in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's not that I fast, but I, I don't eat as much as I probably should just mm-hmm. because – you know, I'm not working, like I work out, but I do a little bit more speed stuff in the afternoon if I'm going to, but it, but it's more for videotaping now. So I yeah. don't train, like I don't know if, if you like, I, I think I, I, I seen on Instagram, like you're doing more um, so uh, powerlifting competitions. Yeah, yeah, I'm a powerlifter. <laughs> now, okay. uh, ex, ex-athlete, now powerlifter. <laughs> So, so that, that, that involves a ton of training, a lot of dedication, whereas mm-hmm. most of the stuff that I'm doing training-wise is more for content, stuff like that. So that keeps mm-hmm. me in shape. So if I'm going to go, you know, uh, you know, do my training, it's more of I'm going to go teach and exercise on camera, on film, and that's going to be, you know, and that's exhausting. So we're doing two, three hours, four hours of that sometimes during oh, yeah. the day. So in the morning, I'm more prepared, getting prepared for that stuff. So I'm going through emails. Um, I might have a nice, easy breakfast. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it, it's nothing really, you know, huge i'm just mostly just getting my day started and just kind of going through that stuff it's more throughout the days when i really start to amp it up a little bit yeah. uh, around this time around 1 one thirty. that's when i usually start to hit more of the stuff yeah. i need to get done because most of the time now is during covid I'm, I'm i'm with my son all day I'm yeah 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 we all know about that <laughs> all right so last question and i'll let you get out of here um what does a strong person mean to you now it could be anything it could be men- you know mentally strong physically strong, psychologically strong. What is uh, What does that mean to you? So maybe even the word strong, you know, that's something that's very consistent, mm-hmm. right? So they're consistently doing things, um, you know, really well all the time, right? Mm-hmm. They have a really strong mindset. So mm-hmm. they're always doing the things that a lot of people don't want to do, right? Mm-hmm. So they're, they're, they're the people that, you know, it's funny, that guy, I read Tim Grover's book, uh, mm-hmm. relentless and it's funny i actually signed up for his course oh, yeah. uh the, the winning mentality i think that starts tonight i think it starts yeah it starts tonight so i'm actually jumping that but you know a strong person a, a person that's a winner that's the person that you're probably calling last right mm-hmm. because you've you've gone you've gone through all the resources and you're like sure i gotta call that person because mm-hmm. you know that person can get the job done probably right mm-hmm. so um i don't know it's just yeah you know, strong to me is just a person that's consistent, has a lot of hard work, you know, a lot of mental, you know, fortitude, a lot of drive, a lot of passion, a lot of determination. Uh, but it's just they're very consistent in what they do. You know, they're, yeah. you know, they're not going to be strong without that. Yeah, I, I do see that. It's a common it's a common theme that um, a lot of the guests now have been saying is that, you know, obviously consistency, you know, um, having the ability to overcome obstacles, um, getting back from losses, you know, and a lot of people aren't saying what most people would think they would say is a strong man or a power lifter or something along the lines of that. Strong means so many different things and so many different avenues. So that's yeah. good. That was a good, uh, good rendition of what you mean. And what we all really want to strive to be is, you know, somewhat of an, of an unstoppable person, right? An immovable object. We want to be as strong as we possibly can to get through life and, and create our legacy. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you your chance right now. We got about, two minutes i want you to make sure that everybody knows where they need to go to check out your quality content social media outlets your your programs anything you want to plug right now go ahead and do it though yeah so they can follow me at pierre's lead performance on instagram on facebook on youtube um yeah man that's basically about it like you know that's where they can find me pierre's lead performance.com uh you know we sell uh, speed and agility equipment, you know, that's mm-hmm. been one of my passions. We even get into that, but you know, it's been one of my passions for a long time is designing, creating, or uh, making equipment better, more durable uh, for your performance. It's not needed, but it can help. Um, so, you know, we, uh, you know, you can get that and just our programs, you know, we have great yeah. programs, but you know, 
it is what it is. You want to get it, you want to get it. If not, you know, I've always been promoting Daru Strong stuff. Like we get a lot of people that ask us, you know, MMA training. I'm like, you got to go to Phil Daru, man. He, he's, 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 he's the best in the business. You know, I've, I have one time, and I'll tell you this before I leave. So I had a boxer, right, mm. uh, maybe about five years ago come and train with me. Mm. And I, I knew nothing about working with boxers or anything. And, he, and he's like, man, can I just come and join your, your, you know, your football program? I'm like, yeah, come on, just join my football program. Yeah. So, so he was doing a lot of you know, speed, agility, quickness, movements, and he absolutely loved it. It was, it was a change of stimulus for him. He had never done anything like that. And he loved it so much. He said, Jay, I want you to come be one of my cornermen. I said, be one of your cornermen? <laughs> <laughs> I know nothing about being a cornerman. So he brings me to his, uh, his head coach in his camp one day. He's like, all you have to do, his head coach says, is put in the uh, stool the <laughs> yeah, and, the... <laughs> and, and, and the bucket. He'll spit in there. You can give him some water, and that's about it. That's it. So basically, <laughs> I, I go to this big boxing fight. I think he was like the co-main event uh, down here in Toronto. And um, – and so we do this walkout of this big, huge stage. And I'm walking out. I'm, I'm doing, I'm putting my hands up. And all the football guys came and watched. They're like, Shay, I thought you were the boxer coming out the way that you were coming out with all that swag and enthusiasm. <laughs> I, I felt absolutely phenomenal. We go in there. He ends up winning. I think it was eight round fight. They're like, you know, two or three minutes or something like that. It was amateur right. stuff. And um, it was such an amazing experience. And after that, I was like, hey, man, you know, he, he wanted to continue the training. And I was like, yeah, you, maybe you should go train with more of a boxing instructor and coach like that like i can't help you as much as you yeah. know as you want so um he's he still comes and does some uh some speed and agility stuff he he, he absolutely loves it yeah. um, he likes that changeover but uh you know i don't I, i've never gone back to do a corner thing i said that was that was the first and only time i ever do that but it was great it was great man you didn't enjoy raising your hands and and, and acting like you were the fighter for a little bit <laughs> <laughs> i came out with the hand up at, and i felt uh i felt pretty good so that, that's awesome man well, man, I'm going to let you go ahead and get on. I got to go train some athletes. Thanks again, bro, for coming on. I know, you know, you had a busy schedule. So I want to thank you. Make sure you guys check him out on Instagram and also check out some of his products that he has too. Very, very important there um, if you're trying to increase your speed and agility. And Shay, I'll see you again. Hopefully we can link up soon. Maybe I'll come out to Canada. We'll do some stuff. All right, man? Yes, take care. Okay, stay blessed. Thank you. All right, brother.